In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, both now and ever, and to the ages of ages. Amen. Glory to thee, our God. Glory to thee, o heavenly King, comforter, spirit of truth, who art everywhere, present and full of soul things, treasure of bliss, and gear of life. Come and abide in us, and cleanse us from every impurity, and save our souls, a good one. Lord of mercy, Lord of mercy, Lord of mercy, glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, both now and ever, and to the ages of ages. Amen. Through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, and save us. Amen. Once again, good evening. Those who want to join us will, will join us. I have to let them in the room like Brendan is coming now and others. So uh, we'll, we'll do that. For now, let me just share the screen. Today we will have to cover some very important topics because not we're not going to talk only about the heresies of the past, but also some modern heresies and how they, uh, the ancient heresies have uh, influenced uh, the reality of today and how we live today so and also ask some questions about artificial intelligence about transgenderism about many challenges that the church is facing in the very near future so of course we, we can make this session a little bit longer in case you have any questions at the end so we can try to answer them all of them and be able to kind of uh, cover this topic so let me just share the screen with you um Okay, share, and uh, I hope we can now, okay. Uh, here, as you know, we talked about uh, many uh, topics, uh, basically the fight against the heresies. We started with the ancient ones. We tried to uh, just put on the meeting view. My computer is usually very slow because we have a lot of tabs and programs open. So we have to be patient. So this is the, the, the topic that we covered. We talked about the symbol of faith, the meaning of the, uh, the words, me and the father are one. We, cov the, we covered the modalism and Sabellianism or Sabellianism. What is a heresy? We know that the heresy is a choice, not something that uh, we... Uh, it's just a misunderstanding or, uh, or linguistic differences. Christ didn't came to bring peace. We talked about Theophilacto uh how to understand the scripture in the correct way. Uh, we talked about the Saint Athanasius, God became man so that man can become gods by grace. We talked about the metaphor, if you will, of the, the, the car wash and that Christ had to save the totality of the human being, meaning his will, his uh, energy, his uh, nature, in order to have a full salvation. We talked about the monophysites and the monotelites, and uh, some of the most important things that uh, are helping us to recognize which is the original, which, which is not. We talked about, this is a very serious topic, which our salvation depends on, and for that reason we want to... Uh, continue today. So we briefly touched upon Docetism, just essentially the Docetists, this, this is an ancient heresy from the very beginning, claimed that Christ did not have a real body. Basically, this comes from another heretical teaching, and we'll get it to later. Then we will see how it came to be in the first place. So God, they say, the Docetists, could not take upon himself a human body. That's very non-appropriate according to them. But there is another teaching which existed before the apostles, and it still exists to this day. It's called Manichaeism. Uh, it's a Manichaeistic teaching that some gods have thrown men into this vertigo we call life, punishing him by giving him bodies. So because the body is from the demons and it's evil, which is a typical Gnostic theology, and we'll talk about Gnosticism soon after, while the soul is from God and it's good. So breaking free from the body is salvific. The body is, quote-unquote, evil. Of course, we know that the body is not evil. God, the Logos, was incarnated into a body like ours, being fully human like us, and, the resurrected, and he resurrected with the body. But they believed that he had a phantom body or a appearance of a body. So what does the Apostle John say? He says in uh, chapter 2, verse uh, John 2, verse 1 to 7, uh, 2 John chapter 1, verse 7, I'm sorry. For many deceivers have gone out and into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. 
sarks. That's what flesh means. This is deceiver and an antichrist. Here is the referring to them, the docetists, because the apostles were still alive when this heresy was, was present at the time. So he calls them deceivers and antichrist. There were many amongst them. The church had a lot of fighting in front of them, but God, but with God's help, the apostles were triumphant over the heretics. This heresy did not last. However, we still have some traces from these false teachings uh, till this day. There are no traces in the Orthodox Church of it, but they can be found in some other heterodox and other even Christian denominations. For example, we have it in the in the Islam, in the Quran, and I quoted this in the Surah 4, uh, verse 157, quote from the Quran. And they did not kill him, nor did they crucify him, but another was made to resemble him to them, referring to Christ. And indeed, those who differ over it are in, uh, are in doubt about it. They have no knowledge of it except the following of assumption. End quote. Muhammad was listening or being influenced by those heretics who were fleeing to the Arabian Peninsula with whom he conversed, that Christ did not have a real body. That's why it entered the Quran. That's why they believe that this is a revealed truth and the Muhammad did not write it this. He didn't wrote this, but God revealed it to them, to the Muslims. Of course, uh, in, the, in the Orthodox theology, we understand uh, Muhammadianism or Islam as a Christian heresy, half Arianism and other heresies that are present over there. That's why uh, we'll move on to the Gnostics, Gnostics and the Gnosticism in San Irene of Lyon. Okay. So, we then come one of the most popular heresies, uh, and that is, which was the greatest enemy of the church, and that is Gnosticism. Uh, we've talked about it before. In short, Gnosticism is a belief that from one side, there is an elite which knows all the mysteries of salvation, how to save your soul, for example. And only those who are initiated in these secrets can learn about these mysteries. You cannot know this on your own. You need them to tell you. So you will have to go to these people who will, quote unquote, help you by looking at some, I don't know, horoscopes, some old writings, some mysticism, and so on. And on the other side is a form of syncretism, which means uh, unification of all the, or a mishmash of all kinds of religions and philosophies and beliefs. A mix of mythology, Egyptian and Babylonian mythology, Judaism, and they'll throw into it also Christ as well. They teach how to liberate your soul from your body. There was a severe confrontation between the church and the Gnostics at the very beginning. So we're now starting with the, with the heresies and the false teachings since the time of the apostles. The greatest enemy is St. Irenae of Lyon, which we have uh, St. John, who was his spiritual father, and then his disciple St. Polycarp of Smyrna, and St. Irenae as the spiritual child of St. Polycarp. So he wrote the book Against Heresies, uh, debunking and exposing the Gnostics. It was a fierce battle which lasted a very long time. You can see almost three generations of, of, uh, uh, of the apostolic succession through the apostles. So today we have something that we call, probably you have heard this word and I have it here on the screen, it's called ethnophilitism, which, in, which has in it some manifestation of Gnosticism. In the Slavic tradition, for example, we have gods, uh, uh, plural, of course, quote-unquote, Perun, Veles, and many others. Then if you combine it with horoscope, with some predictions, and so on, we mix it up with a little bit of Christianity, some symbolism, superstition, and superfluous ideas, and we create a very dangerous mixture of heresies. I want you to know ethnophilism comes from the word ethnos, which means nation, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, and uh, philia, which means love. So ethnophilia or ethnophilism is love of a nation. It manifests itself in nationalism, in uh, all kinds of uh, variations of elevating the nation above God. So the nation or, or the state becomes a God on its own. So the Gnostics did the same, cherry picking from all kinds of rituals and religious beliefs into one pot to create its own version of poisonous beliefs, which will delude many. This was all happening in the first centuries during the time of the apostles. So the question arises, why there was no ecumenical council, even though this was a very serious issue at the time, it was because the church were, was persecuted. On one side, you were persecuted, where someone wanted to eliminate and destroy you physically, while on the other side, you have heretics which you must fight to protect the orthodox flock, the, the right-believing Christians. 
how much grace and divine energy those people must have had to overcome all these attacks against the church. We had enemies from outside and simultaneously from the inside. These heretics were people from the inside, from the church, not from outside, but amongst us. They come to liturgy today, out, and afterwards they preach their heretical stories. Then you, then you ask yourself, well, well, how can this be? How, how is this possible? How can a liturgical people who goes to liturgy hold superstition and heretical narratives? That's why we must be informed and vigilant when we listen to the Word of God and how others interpret it. It is what every Orthodox Christian must ask from God, which is the gift of discernment, to be able to discern the quote-unquote spirits of this time. Because if we get infected, we can poison others with the same heretical ideas. As we all know, so far, there have been seven ecumenical councils. The first was in Nicaea in 325. Uh, the most known against Arius, the heretic. Of course, the ecumenical councils discussed many topics, but today we'll focus mainly on the heretics which caused so many trouble for the faith. So we're going to slowly go through each council and all that it happened. So Arius is a priest reading the scholarly scriptures on his own came to a conclusion that when Christ says, my father is greater than me, and that he is sent by the father, quote unquote, that Christ must be a creation of God, that he cannot be God. And we talked and concluded before with the example of the car wash machine, if you remember from last Wednesday, that if Christ did not take upon himself our full human nature, if he did not deify it, if he did not save the totality of man, the full man, he did not fulfill his ministry. Our soteriology is being destroyed. It's not real. With this incarnation, he took the full human nature. This is something which we'll talk about from the mouth of St. Athanasius, the great himself, who was Arius' greatest contender and champion of orthodoxy. Christ united the divine and the human nature, bringing them again together, but unmixed or confused, but rather in a state of perichoresis, in simultaneous coexistence, having one person, one hypostasis. In Christ are both the divine and the human nature united. However, Arius says, no, he is not God. The statement for our salvation is dramatic. There can be no salvation if Christ is what Arius claim. That's why his greatest conf uh, confrontive is St. Athanasius the Great. Arianism is a very perverted heresy, and it still exists in Islam, for example. For them, Christ is just a prophet. He's not God. He cannot be God. He's just Allah's messenger. He might have some story which can be useful to you, but there is no deification. There is no theosis for them. This is concluded in Islam. Whoever knows Arianism and knows who the church fought against it will easily know how to conform, confront Islam. When you go back into the history of the church and you see how the Holy Fathers fought Arianism, that is how we can confront Islam today. Not with the Muslims, the people, they are not our enemies, but rather the heresy, the false teaching. At a certain point, the Arians were the majority in the East, at least what we call today the Orthodox East. We are talking about uh, Alexandria, which is northern Africa, and parts of the, the Antiochia and so forth. But can you imagine that the Arians of course, were very powerful because of it. Uh, what the Orthodox held as true faith was a minority at the time. That's why I strongly recommend to read Life of the Saints. You will learn a lot about the history of the church, especially the life of St. Athanasius the Great and many other fathers. Because Arianism was not only one teaching, but there were many, like five different directions of this heresy, different streams, different uh, interpretation of the same heresy. As a matter of fact, Arius was not even much more rigorous. He was not one of those kind of fanatical uh, uh, Arianists. There was even more radical teachings than him. That's why the first ecumenical council was convened in 325. And here we see how St. Nicholas uh, uh, slapped Arius in face. If you remember the first icon that we had, which uh, well, you can look at in the, in, the, in the following slides. Then we have the second council, which is, was held just very right after 325, very soon in 381. This council was still fighting Arianism, which was not yet eradicated, was still here, was still there at that time. They discussed many things, but we'll focus only on the major heresy, which why it was important this second ecumenical council was convened. It was about the heresy of Macedonia. He was a bishop of Constantinople, falsely teaching that the Holy Spirit was not God that the Holy Spirit is not the third person of the Holy Trinity. 
This was a dangerous heresy. So the Second Ecumenical Council was convened in Constantinople, where the church was still fighting the Arianism fractions and their teachings, but now we had new heresy too. Heresy too. Remember, when we read the, the symbol of faith, the creed, the creed uh, and we said, and in the Holy Spirit, the giver of life who proceeds from the Father, and so on and so forth, we basically are confessing the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed, which was finally formalized and, and, and given to the church, to the, to the Catholicity, to the universal, universality of the church by uh, 381. In the church, the most fighters against the Macedonian heresy were the Cappadocian fathers, the famous Basil the Great, St. Gregory the Theologian, and St. Gregory of Nyssa. So now my question to all of you is, if people would ask you where in the scripture says that the Holy Spirit is God, how are we going to answer this? Last time we talked where Christ says about himself that he is God. But now the question is, where in the Bible is stated that the Holy Spirit is God? Think about it. You can see this. You see that this is not simple as it seems. You know that situation. We read in the book of Acts when a husband and wife sold their property during the formation of the first Christian community. Where everybody were joining and they were offering everything to common household of the church. It was a, the first Christian communities were very generous in that regard. That's how the church started. However, this was not a must. This was not something that the apostles imposed on the new members of the church, which started to grow, but free will offerings. Ananias, from the book of Acts, as we read, and his wife sold their property. Then they gave some part to the church while they kept something from themselves, while they were talking before people that they gave everything. So basically, they were lying. They were hiding. So what happened? They dropped dead. Ananias was taken out. His wife came into the church, and she fell dead as well. Uh, the husband, after he did this, after he lied, was confronted by St. Peter, who uh, told him the following. In book of Acts, chapter 5, verse 3, we see Ananias, quote, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? Whom did he lie to? In, in, the, in the verse 5, chapter 5, verse 5, you have not lied to men, but to God. This is what St. Peter says to Ananias. Yes, uh, in Genesis, the Holy Spirit. Yes, that's correct. But uh, we'll get to that. So we see that the Holy Spirit is God. This one of the is one of those places in the scriptures where we see that the Holy Spirit is God. There are many places, just as Scott pointed out about uh, in the Gen book of Genesis, but the many places the Holy Spirit is called God. We're just kind of uh, uh, driving through the uh, to the ecumenical councils to I want you to get introduced with the main heresies that were part of the, the the struggle that the church fought from inside. Then we come to the what we call the third ecumenical council. So we're going through the councils fast so we can come to the new modern heresies that we all witness today. So that's why I want you to. Uh, Pay attention. We're not going to be able to hold. Each council deserves its own attention to talk about the, the social aspect of it, the political circumstances, the geographics, the, of course, the historical context and so forth. But we are now just uh, holding on to the main uh, issues, the main main heresies, main false teachings and the main uh, arguments of the church. Uh, because we want to come to the modern heresies, which you will see have their roots in the ancient heresies. So this third ecumenical council was held in Ephesus. I'll show you later on the map to see where all these cities, Nicaea, Constantinople, Ephesus were. And it was in the year 431, which the main topic had was Nestorius, who was a patriarch of Constantinople. Imagine this, Nestorius as a patriarch of Constantinople, imposed teaching that was scandalizing the church and caused a lot of, lot of turmoil. He basically was teaching the following. Since Christ had two natures, the human and the divine, he rationalized, and this is a key word, rationalized, that he must have two persons. In other words, we have a schizophrenic Christ. In Christ, according to him, we have two persons, the son of Mary, the third of course, and the logos of God, which is eternal, and they are united in him. So we come with two persons of Christ. The church was fighting Nestorius' heretical teaching despite that he was a patriarch. What he was teaching was perverted, upside down, because how many persons are in Christ? 
There's only one person of Jesus Christ. That's the eternal logos, the eternal lo word of God, who has two natures. The greatest defender against Nestorian heresy is St. Cyril of Alexandria. So because Nestorius of Nestorius' heretical teaching about the person of Christ, the name of the Theotokos was challenged. Because according to him, Christ had two persons, and his mother, the Theotokos, can give birth to the human Christ with his human nature. The quote-unquote other divine nature was different. She would not give birth to, because she cannot give birth to God, which is true. However, he called her not the Theotokos, but Christotokos. Not the mother of God, but the mother of Christ. But how did we come to call her Theotokos? What did the ecumenical council said about this? What was the solution? Why do we call Mary the Theotokos or the birth giver of God? The Holy Father said that she cannot give birth to something, quote unquote something, but to a person, to someone, not to something. And who is that someone? That is God. That's why she can be Theotokos. But, it, but of course, we don't say that she... God doesn't have a beginning. God was not born of, of a woman ever. But he's, because she, he is born with his divine and human nature from a woman. That's why the church calls it like that. It's a pure respect and honor that we give to a person who brought the salvation to the world to him. That's why today, for example, we'll talk about the Theotokos in our next um, catechism classes, which is next Tuesday, only about her. It's so sad when you see some Protestants coming the church and they get scandalized that we have her as an intercessor before God. It, so much so disrespecting her to the point that they get scandalized by her, ignorant about the fact that without her, Christ uh, wouldn't come. Christ was born out of, of her. So she deserves the respect, just like you are respectful towards your grandparents that they give birth to your parents. So that's why the Protestants have a huge problem with this and we'll cover this, God willing, next, next Tuesday more. Then we go with the Fourth Ecumenical Council, which was held in Halkedon in 451. So if Tychius was the reason why this happened, he was a monk in Constantinople who came to the idea that if there are two natures in Christ, again, rationalization, then the divine nature swallowed up the human nature for Christ to be able. So this is completely opposite of Nestorius. So for Christ to be able to do the things that he did, Otherwise, as a human, he wouldn't be able to do this. So he had to be only divine, and the divine nature swallowed the human nature, consumed the human nature. The divine had to take over human nature in order to make it perform miracles, as we uh, read in the scriptures. Of course, the Holy Father said that Christ has completely human nature, human will, and the divine nature did not confuse, fused, or mixed up the human nature, but rather both nature and will in Christ were united. The greatest opponent of this Eftichian heresy and confessor of the faith was the Roman Pope, which at the time Rome was Orthodox, Pope Leo I, the Patriarch of Rome. The people who stayed in the Eftichian heresy, and later with the Patriarch Dioscor Dioscorus of Alexandria today, are the Monophysites or the Copts, the Ethiopians and the Armenians. They parted ways from Orthodoxy in the 5th century. They did not adopt the canons and the dogmas of the Fourth Ecumenical Council and are out of the church. They're excommunicated. That's why we don't have union with them to this day. That was the first great schism that happened at the time. Even to this day, they say about themselves that they're Orthodox, but they're not. They say that there was only linguistical misunderstanding between the Egyptian and the Greek fathers. And this might have some truth in it, uh, in, in this, because, but they, besides if the, this heresy, also fell into other heresies, which we don't have time to discuss today. We're not in union with them, and this is still not resolved. I don't think that will happen in the near future. So, in the Canon 28 of the Fourth Ecumenical Council, resolved that Rome is first in honor, while Constantinople, as the second Rome, is the second. There were some regions which were not clear who had jurisdiction over them. So Constantinople, and this is very important, remember this Canon 28 of the Fourth Ecumenical Council, we explain why today we have Caesarean Papism even uh, in the Patriarchate of Constantinople. Why is, uh, uh, why is the, uh, this uh, important? My wife just reminded me that not next Tuesday, I'm sorry, we're not gonna talk about the next Tuesday because we're not gonna have, uh, we, have we don't have catechism that first week of the Great Land, we're gonna have the Canon of St. Andrew of Crete, but the following. Uh, the next uh, that comes. So 
Constantinople got them under their oversight, the new territories. Constantinople, regarding this canon from the Fourth Ecumenical Council, today interprets as what we call today diaspora. And so this is very important. Why did they got on the Fourth Ecumenical Council these regions? Because Rome was raided, attacked by barbarians all the time. It, it lost its uh, previous glory and power. So the new Rome, which was in Constantinople, was the center of the Christian life, if you will. So Constantinople even today says that, the, for example, the Serbian Orthodox Church has the rights only on territory of the Republic of Serbia, the Bulgarian Church only over the Republic of Bulgaria, Russia, Romania, and so on, while everything beyond the borders of the states, the national states, they said they belong to us, to Constantinople. So I don't know if you're informed about this, but there are signatures, uh, some bishops even signed this, that they were willing to give the, their, their diaspora to Constantinople. For example, in the United States, we have the, not the Bulgarian, but I think the, uh, some parishes of the Romanian Albanian church, which are autocephalous churches, they are under the, the, the Constantinople Patriarch. The Ukrainians, for example, they are under. When they, what they got with the Constantinople Patriarch, they, all of the diaspora, the Ukrainians, they're not under the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. They're under the, the Constantinople Patriarch, who wants to control all of them. Uh, but this was not yet developed uh, in, in many churches because it was stopped. Uh, but this was the idea. So for us to form some bishopic bodies here in the diaspora, that was the idea, where, for example, the local bishop would belong to, let's say our bishop, with who will preside a bishop from Constantinople. So the civil authorities of the specific states will recognize only the bishop of Constantinople as the main bishop and will correspond only to him. Of course, this is unacceptable, and you'll see why. St. Nikolai of Zicha and Nohrit in his time meets with their future patriarch Meletius Metaxakis, a very suspicious person to say the least. We talked about him <clears throat> regarding, I think that the lecture is, uh, uh, why do we celebrate Christmas on different dates? Uh, why do we have different old and new calendar? Who starts the story in the 20th century. Before that, up until the 20th century, this idea was nowhere to be found. Nobody talked about that, while Constantinople started to interpret the 28th canon of the 40th Ecumenical Council as they, if they were entitled to have the whole world's Orthodox diaspora. Even to this day, they're fighting to acquire the whole diaspora, and strangely enough, some church, churches allow them uh, to be bullied. Of course, this cannot happen with the Serbian, the Russian, and the other churches, but just pointing out, this is the problem, this is where it comes the idea of uh, the uh, modern Constantinople Patriarchate, that they are first uh, uh, beyond equals, which is a heretical teaching to begin, because it's introducing papism in the, in the Orthodox Church, and it's uh, not real. Then we come to the Fifth Ecumenical Council, uh, which was held in Constantinople in 531. Origen, who was a great church teacher and a father, was condemned by this council, which was a continuation of the Fourth Ecumenical Council. You see, the councils are continuation one after another, and you will see that it didn't stop with the Seventh Ecumenical Council, but continued. This council, the church was still fighting against Nestorianism, the monophysites, which was condemned in the Third and the Fourth Council. The monophysis means one nature. The two natures which Christ has were the divine swallowed up the human nature. There was no other more uh, emphasized heresy at this council, but there was the amazing Emperor Justinian the Great, I have the picture of him on the right, who was who organized this council, and that the hymn we chanted every liturgy on the second antiphon, the only begotten son, a hymn which was composed by the Emperor Justinian after the Fifth Ecumenical Council. So if you can imagine what kind of kings we had, glory to God, that even the hymns they composed enter the liturgical services. Um, now the enemies of the Catholicity, of the universality of the church, say your kings determined what you will believe and practice. They say, can't you see that the kings and emperors summoned your councils? Can you see that the emperors were signing the documents, the canons, and the orices, or the borders of the council sessions? The enemy of the Orthodox faith said that it was kings who were deciding about your faith in church. Mainly the Protestants accuse us of this. What do we say to this? The king or the emperor can call upon, can convene the assembly of the bishops of the church. He can sign documents, but he does not participate or participated in the councils. And he was never consulted about the matters of the faith and the matters of the church. They were who were uh, interfering 
but they were all being rejected by the church and they were being excommunicated. His job was to verify the authenticity of the council for the historical consequences and the administration of the dogma which the church proclaimed. His job was logistical to help in collaboration, which was not always beneficial to the church because we have many examples too where they did not know the right place at certain historical moments. But the truth is that they could not interfere with the teachings of the fathers. All the attempts when they tried are recorded in the history of the church as they're unlawful before God and people and before history as a wrongdoing when they supported heresies. It is a complete lie that allegedly the emperors were somehow deciding about something. We see this from the life of the saints all the time. We see one just recently we commemorated the holy father Tarasius from the 7th Ecumenical Council in the 8th century when he forbade holy communion to the emperor because he wanted to marry Another woman, while his wife, he wanted to send her to the monastery or even kill her, accusing her falsely, of course, that she attempted to assassinate him, meaning to poison him. And St. Tarasius forbade him Holy Communion. St. Tarasius suffered from this king until his mother evicted him and restored the Orthodox faith and, and uh, uh, calmed the spirits at the time. But I want you to know there were many examples like this. And the Holy Fathers were defending the church, even paying the price with their own life to protect the church. So... I want to explain something a little more about the word king and emperor. Uh, because when I sit here, St. Justinian composed this important hymn that we chant here in the, in the church, is that the word aristocrat and what king means is that it comes from the Greek word aristos or aristocrat, aristokratos. Aristos means good, someone who is noble. Kratos means someone who holds, who governs. So aristocrat, aristocrat is someone who governs over himself and the nobility that was entrusted in him. So when we say aristocracy, we refer to the noble people who are noble, uh, not because of their wealth and power, but because of their manners, their, their Christian behavior. So the first among the aristocrats was chosen to be the leader, and he will become the emperor or the king. So that's why the emperor is always the icon of piety. That's why you see today, even in, in some royal families today, especially, I don't know, the English king or the queen before him and so forth, the PR structures of the, of the royal uh, palace are so uh, obsessed with the, with the image of the king. The king cannot just go and marry whomever he wants and do so and so forth, because that will be a bad signal to, to his uh, kingdom, to, to his uh, constituents, to those people who, who uh, uh, respect him as a king. So in the Orthodox understanding of the king, it's not someone who is king because he's powerful, but someone who governs over himself above all before he governs over the others. That's why Christ is a king, the only true king that, uh, the, that we will have. And we have. And we'll have. Then we come to the Sixth Ecumenical Council, and this is St. Maximus the Confessor. This council uh, was held in 681. So we had Arius, Nestorius, Eutychius, Dioscorus, Origen, the two natures, dogma, and they then they started asking about the energies and the wills of Christ. Here is what we have with St. Maximus, the confessor, who fought the heresy of monothelitism. So if mono, uh, 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 monophysitism, which was one nature, monothelia, the, thelos, the, thelia, in Greek means will, monothelia means one will. This heresy was claiming that Christ did not have human will, that everything was divine will and that he did not have a human energy or action. So Maximus the Confessor says, no. Christ has both, two nature, two wills, and two energies. And the reason why this was important, we're not going to be able to talk about this very much now because we have so much to cover, is because once when you diminish one of those things, you confuse them, then the whole concept, the whole dogma, the whole truth about who the Holy Trinity is, who Christ is, and so forth, falls apart. And our soteriology is being completely confused. And for that reason, they punished him by cutting off his tongue and his hands so that uh, he will not be able to speak or write the Orthodox uh, uh, faith and, and embolden the Christians to, to will. However, he prevailed where the kings who were against him and the, in the, the royal court and so forth, you know, they uh, ended up in, unfortunately, in heresy. Then finally, we have the Seventh Ecumenical Council, Council in 787 in Nicaea. Here the church fought the heresy of iconoclasm. 
I strongly recommend to watch or listen the catechism we had about St. Stephen the New, an iconoclasm, an important, uh, an important uh, understanding of, of why the church gave to anathema those who don't venerate the icons, not worship, but venerate the icons. Um, so iconoclasts were the people who rejected the veneration of the icons. This was not only about the veneration of the icons, but rather the su sublimation of all the previous heresies which attacked the church from the beginning, which were still alive and present in one form or another in the church until that time. Some were still disputing that Christ had a real human body. His incarnation was in question, was disputed. That's why they said we should not venerate an icon because he did not have a real body. Because what in essence is the icon is to show the incarnation of the Logos of God. Because what we see on the icon is that Christ has indeed a real body. So when we kiss the icon of Christ, we don't kiss the divinity of Christ, meaning his divine nature. You kiss his historical, tangible human nature that he had, he was incarnated in. That he has true, authentic, full human nature and we see one person on the icon. We see his human, tangible nature, will and energy, not the divine, which is indescribable, incomprehensible for the human logical noose to grasp and understand. That's why I want you to know that iconoclasm is not only about defending the icons as such, but is much deeper and wider in explaining the whole theology of who God is and how he revealed himself to the mankind. So the defenders of the incarnation of the Logos and the icons are St. John of Damascus and Theodore Studid, Holy Patriarch Tarasius, whom I mentioned, who forbade that king to uh, receive Holy Communion and so on. So, for example, St. John of Damascus was a monk, great hymnographer, a teacher of the faith, lived in the 8th century in an enslaved and occupied uh, place by the Muslims, which was Damascus, in a very difficult environment for the Orthodox Church. He lived in a ghetto, in, if you will. Damascus was a, uh, at that time, the city of Damascus was a Muslim caliphate, and Islam took over those promises of the Roman Emperor, and he, in those conditions, was... It was naturally under the governance of the caliphate, not under the Byzantine Emperor. So just as we're, for example, citizen under any government of uh, today's world. So despite all the circumstances he was in, he was still defending the icons and the incarnation of Logos in front of the Muslims. So can you imagine what kind of a person you must be living in that environment and surrounded with Muslims from all sides who are absolutely against the icons and do not believe in Christ as the Son of God? Plus he had the Byzantine emperor and the Roman administration against him, which constantly slandered him. Read his life, it is truly amazing. And John, John of Damascus was accused that he was a spy for the Byzantine emperor by spies of the Byzantine emperor. And he was, uh, his hand was cut off by the Muslims. Uh, of course, they apologized to him when they realized that their own Christians betrayed him, who at that time were iconoclasts. This was in the time of uh, Leo the Savrian, and his son, there were like three or four kings who were complete uh, iconoclasts, and they were removing the icons and so forth. Uh, the reasons we'll, we'll talk about iconoclasm even more. We don't have time to, to, to cover everything, but I want you to know that uh, iconoclasm is not only about, let's say, defense of the icons. It's about the defending of the incarnation that Christ indeed became human being. I remember when I was a kid in communist classes, they would tell us Christ was just a... Um, a very intelligent man, a good man, a socialist or whatever. Uh, but they couldn't deny his historical reality. Why? Because God was incarnated. And the icon actually confirms that and defends that theology of the church. So now we come to the modern um, uh, modern times in the contemporary heres heresy slowly. Constantinople... Uh, at that time, while the councils were happening, is from the European side. And you can see here on the map. Uh, one of the councils was in Halkidon, which was uh, from the other, the Asian side of the emperor. So where Nicaea is, and see where Ephesus is. You see Nicaea is right after, under Nicomedia. And Ephesus is, of course, this is today's Turkey, on the west bank of uh, today's Republic of Turkey. Um, this is just for you to have some orientation where the councils were held at the time. You see, where, uh, uh, where Damascus is and so forth at that time would be uh, not longer under the Byzantine Empire. So we come to, which we will celebrate uh, very soon, in a couple of weeks, the Sunday of Orthodoxy, which is the first Sunday of the Great Land. So this feast was established in 843 in the 9th century. 
While we know that the Seventh Ecumenical Council resolved the veneration of the icons almost 120 years earlier in 787, in the 8th century. So why there is a different date and year? This was because not everyone was in union regarding the teachings of the Seventh Ecumenical Council. It took a century to accept the dogmas of the 787, the Seventh Ecumenical Council. The fight against the iconoclasm or against the icons, the iconoclasts lasted another 70 years after the Ecumenical Council. So finally, in 843, and in the ninth century, we had the triumph of orthodoxy. It was not a resolved thing right away. It took time for it. Just because the councils uh, made the decisions that did not stop the heretics from continuing with their presence. Church had to continue to fight iconoclasm for all together around 120 years. So what is also very interesting to mention here, so by the way, to mention, when the Protestants, they say they don't venerate icons and so forth, I want you to know they are iconoclasts, and that's a big problem. And usually the way they attack us, the Orthodox, they say, well, uh, you're inconsiderate, incompassionate, because you are not considering us uh, as, as you, equal Christians, uh, and they attack us only because of that. But when we sit down and talk about the arguments, then we can just expose them that, that uh, listen this this was resolved by the church in the eighth uh, in the ninth century it was not coming from yesterday uh, and we just woke up one day and we're going to have icons icons were present in the church since the very beginning of the time of the apostles if you go to the uh, catacombs of jerusalem of antioch of rome of uh, athens of many places where the christians were hiding in catacombs they were all painted with icons of their relatives who were martyred because of christ and of course, icons of Christ, of his mother, and many others. That's why the icons is not an invention. Icons, we could not uh, venerate publicly in the first three centuries because the church was what? It was persecuted. We never had temples. We had nothing. Only after that, the church started to adorn uh, itself and so on. We'll, we'll cover it about this more. But what is also very interesting to mention here is that on the Sunday, we read the anathemas, against all heresies which came to be both ancient and more recent. We read the Synodicon of Orthodoxy on that Sunday as well. As if you come on church on Sunday, uh, on a Triumph of Orthodoxy, you will see what we read. The church exclaims loudly and transparently the anathemas against Arius, Nestorius, and many other heresies. Unfortunately, uh, you have never heard those anathemas today because they're very rarely read in churches today because we will have to proclaim them against the Pope, against many others simultaneously. But because it is not politically correct, this is not being the practice in some churches for some time. It has nothing to do with the faith. The correct way is to do that. But on Sunday of Orthodoxy, the bishop must come out and proclaim anathemas to all the heretics because this is a victory or triumph of Orthodoxy. Unfortunately, we don't see this as often. There was this bishop militant from Valjevo in Serbia, who recently reposed, who um, I think a couple of years ago, three years ago, who always did this. He would come on Sunday of Orthodoxy and would start to say anathema to Nestorius, the Arius, Monophysis, the Pope, and so on. The only downfall to joke a little bit of the service is that lasts a little bit longer than people would like, but it's worth it. So the councils, however, continued in the church after the Seventh Ecumenical Council. Then we have they didn't stop. They, 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 we had new councils. We have the, uh, uh, the Council of Constantinople, the so-called Council of St. Photius, which is considered as the Eighth Ecumenical Council in eight, 880. He told Rome at that time, which is 150 years before uh, the split of the church, which at that time was still in union with the Orthodox, that they had gone too far and they, he said to them, you will create a schism if you continue with your teaching about the filioque, which means end from the sun, uh, which is wrong, and you will fall away from the church. He warned them in the ninth century about it, almost 150 years earlier than the great schism in 1054. That's why he organized the council in Constantinople and told the Roman patriarch to be careful you're holding erroneous teachings. We're tolerating it for now, and you are ignoring us. If you don't stop, we will have a problem in the church. And as we all know, unfortunately, this problem occurred later. Rome fell away from the church. So why this all happened? Filioque means end from the sun in Latin. 
That is, that the Holy Spirit comes out or proceeds in from the Son, the Logos. They added this to the symbol of faith we all had for so many years. Before that, there was not an issue in the church for this. So what is so wrong with this? Why is it so problematic to say that Filioque, that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and from the Son? By the way, all the Protestants, they accept the Filioque because they are basically a little Roman Catholics. They come out of the Roman Catholic Church and they adopted all of those teachings, even though many of them are not even aware of that. And that the church, this is one of the big reasons why Filioque uh, was the cause for the split between the East and the West. So why, why is the problem that the Father, uh, the Holy Spirit comes from the Father and from the Son? You see, the council convened to discuss this issue, this, in, this one council uh, in 880, uh, seeing it is a very important theological problem. As Orthodox, we have always believed that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and not from the Son. So why is this such a big issue? Why did it become such a problem that we got separated from each other and we are still without communion until this very day, for 1,000 years? 1,000 years we were together, then 1,000 years we are now separated. So remember the words earlier of Abba Justin Popper, this is from the last Wednesday, when he says, that the mystery of all mysteries is the dogma of the Holy Trinity. If this dogma is not correctly defined and explained, everything else can collapse and would not be correct. In the dogma of the Holy Trinity, through the Holy Council, we know that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. This is very important. We talked about before about the monarchy of God and the Father. And I have here a little bit of um, kind of a, um, uh, graphics to see uh, what we're talking. I explain even more. So why um, we are able to defend the theology that we believe, we believe in one God and not in three gods. For example, the Muslims will say to us, "Well, you believe in three gods: the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit." You can answer, "We're not polytheists. We believe in one God." But how and why do we say this? We talked about it, if you remember, on catechism classes yesterday, but uh, let, let's explain. The essence of the very nature of God comes out from God the Father. He is the, what we call Iarhi, not the Son, not the Holy Spirit, but the Father. The Son is being born. He is begotten from the essence or the nature of the Father, and the Holy Spirit proceeds from the nature of the essence of the Father. Comes out from the same essence of God the Father. This essence is in the Son and in the Holy Spirit. They all come out of, out from the same essence. That's why some are confused and say that we believe in three gods. No. The essence is in the Father. He is the Iarchi. He is the, the first principle, if you will. So they're of one essence, which is one God the Father. So what do we get if the Holy Spirit proceeds in from the Son with the Filioque? If we accept this heresy, we have two principles now. It is no longer one God, and this is a problem. We can no longer defend the dogma that we believe in one God. That's the problem. The enemies of the church will say, you believe in two gods. What the Latins did is that they destroyed or broke the dogma of the Holy Trinity, which is the dogma of all dogmas. If we get this wrong, then everything else shall be wrong as it is today. That's why today have all the consequences of, 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 of the of the wrong teaching of the dogma. And no matter what kind of excuse you'll find, because what's happening is, yes, you will uh, change the dogma, then uh, the consequences of that teaching, and they develop, they have something what they call developed theology, and we don't have that, because Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You then come out with the uncreated, uh, and created, we get the created uh, energy, or the created grace, unleavened breads, so you come with the uh, immaculate conception of the third of course you come with all kinds of teachings that are have uh, just just create more and more confusion and separate you from 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 the source teaching that the holy apostles have given to us for this reason saint photius warns them in 880 come back to your senses don't forget this is a time when islam as an arian heresy was already causing issues waging wars against the roman empire in 880 this is the ninth century or, he says to them, you will fall away from the church. And they did in 1054. 
So please understand the filioque is not just some addition or a small mistake, but deformation of the true dogma with capital letters of the Holy Trinity. If you accept it, you have created two principles in God and made him no longer one God. But in one God, but, but God is only one principle, one archi, one source, one essence, and one divinity. God the Father, who has three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But it's one God and he, uh, the Son and the Holy Spirit, they share the nature of the Father. That's why they are not gods, but they are also God. So they are God because God the Father is God. Can we separate the, the, the light and the warmth that the sun emanates? No. The disk of the sun is the reason, it gives the nature of the, or, or is the nature that gives to the, to the, uh, the, the, the sun's, the rays of the sun and the worm. So that's why, even though it's manifests three components, like the disk, the, the source, the, the, the sunlight or the light and the worm, we cannot be separated. They have same nature. That's why uh, we, we need to be take this very serious. Uh, it will explain even more well. Then we continue. Uh, there is a, another important uh, council, which is the council uh, in the, uh, the fifth council in Constantinople in, in the 14th century, 1351, regarding hisichasm. The word hisichasm means isichia, in Greek means silence. And those are the fathers who lived in the desert and uh, they pursued it silence calming of the passion and ascetical work, which this council, when it defends the Hisigans, was against, again, against the Latins. We have St. Gregory Palamas, uh, and I have prepared other videos about it. You can watch when you like. And we, because we, it was Orthodox confessed that the essence of man's life is theosis, is deification. That is his salvation. The salvation is deification, to become godlike. The energies which God is giving to us in the Holy Communion, for example, are uncreated energies through whom man is being deified. The Latins, on the other hand, thought that no, those are created energies. And even this might look confusing to some of you, the consequences from not having orthodox understanding are devastating because they lead to humanism and alienation from God in, his, in intimate embrace. If you believe that the energy is created, then you can easily pack them like a Coca-Cola cans, and sell indulgences. You give me $1,000, I'll give you 1,000 packages of forgiveness or grace in return. And then the fate becomes absurd, which led to some theological, soteriological consequences later. We, re we receive divine uncreated energies which deifies. And that is our salvation. So the council was organized, organized in 1351. We'll, we'll talk about, I prepared some other videos only about this with St. Gregory Palamas and the Synaxarion, whom we celebrated on the second uh, Sunday after the Sunday of Orthodoxy, second Sunday of the Great Lent. We'll be able to hear it. Then we have the councils in Jerusalem in 1672, then another one in Constantinople in 1692. This is in the 17th centuries, barely 100 years after the Reformation. Are any of you familiar with them? The church never stopped with its councils. People are not aware of it. This specific councils, there's two of them at least, was a reaction against Protestantism or Luther more specifically regarding what he was doing in the West. The Orthodox Church reacts to it because some teachings have reached Orthodoxy too. Some started to get poisoned by Luther and Protestant doctrines. And the church in its reaction against their so-called Reformation theology Proclaim them as heretical. Martin Luther in the Orthodox Church is a heretic. Here is another council in 1583. This was about the papist calendar, which the church rejected as an innovation. The church reacted right away. There was not like we didn't, the, the Orthodox fell asleep and they woke up, I don't know, in the 19th century and then they started. No, it was constantly present about this thing. So the church was important. They wanted to uh, uh, express their opinion. Now we come to the renewed ancient heresies of the modern heresies. In some of the last Bible studies, we touched upon the quote-unquote sleeping souls. Uh, this is an important topic because these false teachings are happening inside the church because under the influence of foreign teachings, even some clergy fell into this delusion. Because what is the problem 
with the so-called sleeping of the souls after biological death. For example, the Adventists and some others, they think that, well, uh, they take some parts of the, of the Bible, cherry-picking verses of the Bible, and they impose this as a, as a teaching. They create their own religions out of it. So what crumbles this teaching if we believe that the souls sleep after biological death? They say the resurrection will happen at the end, like we all believe. But why is this heretical? What is the problem if you believe that the souls after death are only asleep? So let me ask you a question. If we ask the intercession of St. Nicholas, let's say we read his Akathis or the Theotokos and he is asleep, then how can you read an Akathis to him or to the Theotokos and so on or Basil of Ostrog, for example, if he sleeps, I don't know, under the mountain where he was buried? They might say, well, those are holy people. They are special. They do not sleep, but, they, uh, but the rest of them do. So uh, something, you know, along those lines. And this is an Orthodox church inside of the Orthodox Church, not outside, like, like the Adventists or the Jehovah Witnesses or Islam. But today we're not talking about that. We're talking about the heresies that unfortunately got influenced from outside sources. So let us ask for something experiential, not just from the Holy Fathers only, but from personal experience, something which is relatable to all of us. It, quote, in the heavenly courts, the bold martyrs unceasingly are praying to thee, O Christ, make him worthy to gain to it the eternal blessings, this faithful, this thy faithful servant, whom you have taken from the earth. This is what we pray during the funeral service. This is from one of the hymns of St. John of Damascus, a saint from the 8th century, which composed. So when someone, someone dies, what happens with these heavenly courts? Some brave, bold martyrs unceasingly are praying to Christ. This is exactly what we read even in the book of Revelation. They're obviously not sleeping. This is an ancient service. For thou art Christ, quote another, for thou art Christ our creator, give, us, give rest to thy servants in the living mansions of the righteous. It is not the mansions of the sleeping ones, but the living ones. We don't have to quote the Holy Fathers. Just look at the story about the Lazarus and the rich men. He's fully aware that he ended up in hell. He's fully aware that he sees Lazarus in the bosom of Abraham. He even converses with Abraham about to go and warn his five brothers who live in negligence. Which means that even though he died, his soul is very much aware of all this. So this was, uh, that's why we don't have to hold the quote, Holy Fathers more on this. This was never an issue for the Holy Fathers. This question was always understood as such. There was not need there was no need to talk about it because everyone throughout the ages within the church understood very well that the souls do not sleep after that. This is a modern heresy, modern issue. Then we have the following prayer, which is again from the funeral service. O God of spirits and of all flesh, who has trampled down death and overthrown the devil and given life to the world, do thou the same, Lord. Give rest to the souls of thy departed servants in a place. What place? of brightness, a place of refreshment, a place of repose, where all sickness, sighing, and sorrow have fled away. Why would he be in this place if he is asleep? Pardon every transgression which they have committed, whether by word or deed or thought. For thou art good God and lovest mankind, because there is no man who lives yet does not sin, for thou only art without sin. Thy righteousness to all eternity in the word is true. This, was found, this is found in every small book of needs that every priest has. And if you are carefully listening to the priest and the prayers, he's saying what he's saying, and you will see what the church is teaching regarding this. Because this is the paradosis of the church. This is the holy tradition of the church since the time of the apostles. Then we have a heresy of heliasm, which means 1,000 years comes from the Greek word hiliad, hiliad which means 1,000 years. In many languages, the word thousand comes from, into heliads. So what is the essence of this heresy? If you look at Revelation chapter 20, verse 4, we read, And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their forehead or in their heads. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a, a thousand years. This is the key moment, thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. The heretical heliasts thought that there will be a Christ kingdom on which will last for 1,000 years. Kingdom of pure bliss and prosperity. And then only after that period, the judgment day will come and eternity will come at end. 
The Holy Fathers were very quickly confronted, were confronting this false teaching specifically on the Second Ecumenical Council in 381, in the, in the fourth century. So how did they do this? First, they proclaimed it as a heresy, and second, in the symbol of faith, they inserted these two words, and to his kingdom there shall be no end, as the symbol of faith. This was added against the Heliasts. That's why in the Orthodox Church is no longer present, but it is very present among the Protestants. They tweaked it a little bit, but do they teach about it? Yes, of course. In the meantime, they teach that before the Antichrist will appear, that they, as chosen ones, will be raptured into heavens, and the Antichrist will be left to persecute all the other people, while they will enjoy living with Christ for 1,000 years. Then Christ will come back again. He will allegedly let Sandin once more to torture mankind for like seven years. And right after the judgment day follows, or at least uh, the, this is one of the variations they have. This is what the heresy of Helism does, which was condemned by the Second Medical Council's heretical teaching. Look at how delusional it is to think that uh, those who will be raptured, uh, they will somehow be saved from the, uh, from the temptations of the, uh, of the Antichrist. Why would, why would Christ do so? Why would Christ be so unfair? On, on the other hand, aren't we supposed to prove our faithfulness and willingness to give even our life for Christ and for, for each other in the times of persecution? It's very illogical, the borderline demonic. So if you hear any Protestants who believe in this, please direct them towards the Second Ecumenical Council, which says that those 1,000 years is symbolical time. That's not exactly our 1,000 years, which is a human construct. This is the time between his first coming, his resurrection, and his second coming. Satan is bound up. He does not have total power, even though he still makes trouble, as we're all witnesses. Then at a certain moment, he will be allowed to, in the last seven years before the end, uh, the world as we know it, to appear. And Christ will come, and the eschaton will come to place, the end of uh, uh, everything. The eternity will begin. The Holy Fathers have resolved this on the Second Ecumenical Council, but unfortunately still alive. Then we have, if you remember, the heresy of apocatastasis is for the restoration. We covered this topic when we talked about the origin uh, during our Bible studies. Shortly, we can add here that this was an ancient false teaching which was condemned and exposed in the Fifth Ecumenical Council, which was promoted by Origen, a very educated man from Alexandria, a priest um, uh, from the second and the third centuries. He was teaching that at the end times, God will restore everything as it was before the fall of Adam, or in other words, everyone will be saved. This is key heresy. The church condemned this teaching, but even to this day, this type of at least some version of it, like the New Age types of uh, thinking and so forth, are reappearing maybe, not under this name, but you can see it in the certain teachings where they say that salvation already happened. Christ has ensured our salvation, once saved, always saved. What cross? You don't need a cross. Nobody cares a cross. Uh, what asceticism, and fasting, just believe in, and uh, eat, believe in, and in Orthodox mindset, it says you just receive Holy Communion. You don't have to do anything. These are the consequences or the symptoms of the apocatastasis. Our free will is being completely removed. Because uh, what, what happens is even worse. Even the demons can be saved. Because God doesn't allow to have a free will to be against him. And this, that's why it's demonic. That's why it's heretical. So the Holy Fathers are teaching us that we must carry out the cross which God gave us everyone according to his capabilities. Someone has a smaller, another a bigger cross to carry, ascending towards the mountain of salvation through the paved way shown by to us, to us by Christ and the Holy Fathers who followed it and were saved. While the believers of the apocatastasis or the restoration say, no, there is no need to do this. At the end, all will be saved regardless. So why is this heretical? Because it denies the very essence of what makes us according to the image and likeness of God. And this is our freedom or free will. What if someone does not want to be saved? What if the demons or demon like people do not want to be saved? Can we force them to salvation? Just like we can force them, someone to love us, we should also cannot enforce salvation. So if so, then where is the freedom not to be with God? If God does not respect and honor our free will, then it means that he is a tyrant who wants to impose himself on us and force us to be with him regardless. According to this heresy, we concluded that even the devil will be saved. The hell will be empty and no one will dwell in it anymore. They say, don't worry much. Just go ahead, believe and receive communion regardless of fasting and prayer. That's not important. That's for the, that's, we're modern people. We don't do that anymore. Then 
this is the a movie from HBO. Uh, it's called The Borgias. Uh, uh, I don't recommend watching it, but just wanted to talk about the following topic. This is technically not a heresy, but a sin. It's called simony or simony. However, it is presented to this. So what is simony or simony? In the book of Acts, when we see how the apostles were preaching the word of God, and at one moment, they, uh, they chase away an evil spirit from one man. This was present. Uh, there was a, a witch or a magi, Simon, who witnessed the whole scene, if you read in the book of Acts. Then he says to the apostles, let me pay you some money so I can do the same thing. You are doing it because of an, uh, uh, in the name of God, while I can do it for my own business. He was a businessman who wanted to find another way to profit. So this attempt to, quote-unquote, purchase the grace of the Holy Spirit or the attempt to bribe the apostles for personal gain, to buy out uh, an ordination into priesthood, for example. Uh, it is basically uh, uh, started to be called Simonia according to his name, Simon or Simonia. It is basically buying off a cler clerical ordination. And this show, this movie or, or series of, of shows is it's disgusting how how that is kind of became a norm in the in the West. Of course, we don't have this glory to God in the Orthodox Church, but see that it existed as a temptation in history where some wanted to buy for themselves priestly ordination or bishopric ordination. However, there can be some elements of it when we see that let's say uh, there is an assembly of bishops, and when some try to do what we call lobbying uh, for someone to get to the position of a bishop. Like the choice for the ordination, the priesthood is not an action of the Holy Spirit. We can only, him and God's providence, choose a candidate for ordination. Those can be the elements of simony or simony. That's why I told you about this HBO show about the Borgias or Borgias. There you can see the magnitude of corruption and the danger of simony, among other things. There were other examples elsewhere as well, unfortunately, during the Ottoman Empire and the Orthodox Church and so forth. So this is on John Chrysostom from the 5th century was talking about this. Uh, he was saying, you have bishops who were chosen by the Holy Spirit, and you have some of them who were chosen by the people, referring to those who were political appointees. You see, at that time, the church was growing. Almost all of the, the Roman Empire was becoming Christian. Many people were becoming Christians not because they truly believed in Christ, but because they wanted to political assign, a political position, and so forth. Then he read another expensive word, uh, ethnophilitism, I said something about this. The word ethnos means people or nation. Philitism or ethnophilitism from the Greek word ethnos, the tradition ethnos or uh, not a little translation and philetikos or philia, which in, in this case can be tribal or love for the nation, is the principle of nationality supplied in the ecclesiastical domain. Philia also means love. In other words, means to elevate our national identity above Christ's identity make it priority to vote for some political option to save the nation and to save our own souls. Even though we want both, we can't fall into the trap of creating idols of the nation or the people, the state, the government, and so on, the political party maybe. So there is nothing wrong to be patriotic and to love your country, your people, and your nation, to die, even die defending them, but not to elevate them above God and make idols out of them. For example, you can see this in the churches in the diaspora like we have here in the U.S., we don't have that as much in our parish, to be clear, but, they, uh, but the way you will notice it and recognize it is when you hear people complaining that the church services are mostly in English and not in, let's say, I don't know, Serbian, Greek, and so on. So some people, when they see those who are coming to a parish, regardless of its, if it's Serbian, Greek, Russian, then they first must learn the native language to drink some rakia, to know the folklore, and then can be, they can truly become, quote-unquote, Orthodox. Yes, this was and is in some places still present among some people who love their heritage more than Christ, or at least they think that the national identity is more relevant than Christ. This is ethnophilitism. All the national churches can fall into this heresy, and it's a very real today. For example, the Greek church suffers in the opinion that the Greeks are always more orthodox than the others. The Serbs, by thinking that everyone came from them, the Russians and others have their own kind of ethnical mythology instead of orthodox. Of course, this cannot define the whole church, which is above all one holy, Catholic, and apostolic. It is basically absurd. It all started with the 1826 council in Constantinople, which condemned ethnophilitism because of the Bulgarian schism, wanted to gain independence of the state, but also wanted to have their independent autocephalous church. But instead of doing it in a canonical way, they wanted to do it through, uh, through ethnophilitistic way. 
We would not go into details today because we would not have time, but we can talk about it during some other Bible studies. This is our bishop, uh, uh, archbishop from the Serbian Orthodox Church. Now he's a metropolitan of Kruševo who talked about that the ecclesiastical divisions have their roots in ethnophilitism and politics. Uh, and uh, he was a, a, a confessor of the faith so many years uh, against, for 20 years, against ethnophilitistic heresies. We have the heresy of Sergianism, which is also present today. So what is it? Sergius was a metropolitan who later became a patriarch when the Soviets came in power in Russia and they created the USSR, the communist uh, USSR, and they held the church captive under their dominion. Then the Russian Orthodox Church out of Russia was created, which does not want to be under the governance of the communist authorities because they were godless atheists, but some hierarch in, hierarchs in Moscow remained loyal to the communist regime. They even wrote a declaration that they were loyal to the Soviet godless authorities. For this responsible, but this was responsible Metropolitan Sergei. He was obedient to the government, to the Soviet government. In other words, the government becomes the higher authority over the church, which is absurd. That's how this heresy was called, Sergianism. Today we can see it in certain elements of the society, which likes to be faithful to the governments of this world, even if they are publicly against the church and God. Like when we see the government officials give medals to clergy when certain professors preach monkeyology or Darwinism in universities, which originally belongs to the church, but is sponsored by the state, so you cannot remove them no matter what because they're state apparatchiks and so on. When the priesthood is completely dependent on the state budgets and because of it, their livelihood depends on the government instead of the one of the altar as God ordered way by since in the time of Moses, that the priests should live from the offerings of the altar. Those are some of the elements of Sergianism heresy that we see today. For example, I as a priest should not get involved in the politics of the society. I don't even vote unless there are certain phenomena which distorts the life and the teachings of the church and they can force the priesthood to publicly speak out. Like when we see the promotion of genderism, homosexuality, and many other perverted policies which can harm the people in the church who are entrusted to the clergy by God. If there is any kind of promotion of sin by the government which imposes to the people in those cases, we might have to react and clarify the position of the church and teachings of the Holy Fathers. Because if you don't react, then we will have the elements of Sergianism. Some people will say, you the priest should not interfere into politics. But let me ask you this. Was St. John interfering, John the Baptist meaning, interfering into politics when he told Herod that he cannot marry a woman of his brother who was still alive? He was beheaded because of it, because of the public moral. A true bishop cannot compromise with a king who wants to marry a woman of his own brother. He can say to him, your majesty is king. You are the keeper of the moral way of life. You cannot marry this woman because it's adultery. Then we come, and this is another important topic, the heresy of the theistic Darwinism. This is another heavy and expensive word. Every heresy has some heavy words inside of them. We all know what Darwinism is, but what is theistic Darwinism? In short, God used the laws of evolution to create man, meaning there were centuries, millions and billions of years where man was formed and God used it and embraced his spirit unto him and created Adam. They took Darwinism and because some people are so afraid of the so-called modern science, like it proved something about the existence of man, that the earth is much older than what the Bible describes, that the creation narrative could not be happened in six days and so on, all of that is proclaimed by some parts of the scientific world. So now in order to comply with them and to please them, some clergy said, well, I guess it's possible to accept that man came out of monkeys, that it could be possible that God used the laws of evolution just as Darwin preached and God just jumped on board and it somehow happened. What is the problem with the Darwinistic, uh, with the uh, theistic Darwinism? For example, there's one priest who preaches this nonsense. You might say he doesn't know what he's talking about, but why we, would, we could not accept this heresy? Why is it a heresy? Because the Bible says so. But he will say, well, you can interpret the Bible in many ways, allegorically and literally. What is in the essence of Darwinism? What moves Darwinism and evolution? What is most necessary for this natural selection to evolve, for the stronger to overcome the weaker, and through this proves the, to create a species which are is immune and strong. What is necessary for this to happen? Death. Death is necessary. We need eons and millennia of death to come to man. 
But what does the Holy Scripture says? How did the earth enter? How did death enter the world? Through sin. Who committed the sin? Man, Adam and Eve. God never created death. So when you claim that theistic Darwinism is true, you are accusing God that he created death. The species must kill each other to create the natural selection, and only after that he jumps in, takes over, and man is created. This is a big problem. You see what theistic Darwinism claims. We don't know even the real ingredients of Coca-Cola and the aspirin, but we're not stupid. We can recognize some things and sense which is and which is not the original and true. So I'll pause here because obviously we won't have time to, to finish everything. We wanted to cover, just for your information, ecumenism, and we'll, we'll do that maybe on our uh, Tuesday um, catechism. You're welcome to come. Then we'll talk about how to fight against the modern heresies, which is a topic that it's very important to cover. Our fight against the heresies must rely on orthodox and orthodox and orthopraxia, orthopraxis. St. Basil the Great was an ecumenist, and we'll see why do some people think, but of course he wasn't, but we'll explain and his uh, interaction with Emperor Valent uh, in the internet orthodoxy. Also, people can accuse St. Mark of Ephesus as an ecumenist, of course, that's false, but we need to learn. We want to hear something from St. Nicholas of Zicha and Ocrit, St. Ignatius Briancino, how to fight against the heresies. And then finally, we'll talk about what awaits us in the future, the question of genderism, marriage with heterodox, the so-called deaconesses, artificial intelligence. And then finally, we'll finish with the false union that is imposed on us and where they wanted to do it in 2025 between Rome and Constantinople. We won't have time to talk because you see there's all very important topics and we're already beyond time. Also, I have to go in 7.30, I have a confession. So I need to uh, be there. But if you have any quickly any questions, we can uh, uh, try to uh, try about the things that we talked today. We can uh, we can talk. Um, let me see. Um, so yes, there is an icon about the icons. Thank you for. Uh, let me see. How about in Genesis where it says the spirit movie? Yeah, that's okay. Next Tuesday we have the canopies and there is no class. Yes, that's let's do. That's we're talking about Tuesday which is uh, according to the calendar. Uh, it will be not next Tuesday, which is the 19th, the 26th. Then we can finish this lecture, but also cover some other topics. Uh, yes. Uh, so, okay. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. If not, we can, uh, we can say the prayer. Uh, why is nature used to describe divinity? Is there simply no? Yes, there is usia, essence. Uh, that's what we use. Nature is physis. Uh, that's a different word, but we use the word usia. Yeah, everyone please pray for Mark and others who are living for the Father Peter. Here's another, yeah, they're traveling to Alabama. Yeah, glory to God. Uh, we're praying for their safe arrival. They're leaving very early in the morning. So yeah, we'll keep them in prayer. Anyway, what I want you to know is that uh, we'll cover this. Uh, uh, we'll cover this topic about the humanism, uh, which is very important. About how to fight the modern heresies. Uh, we'll talk about Saint Basil of uh, the Great, Saint Mark of Ephesus, Saint Nicholas of Zich, and Saint Ignatius, Ignatius Briancino, of how to understand heresies, how to uh, approach them, and what awaits us in the near future. I told you about the. Uh, genderism, homosexual marriages, the so-called deaconesses in church will clarify all of that. And finally, the full union they're trying to impose on, on the church. Today, we were able to cover as much. Otherwise, uh, it's going to take us uh, too long. So please understand, we're not having catechism, uh, Bible study classes in the, up until the end of the Great Lent because we will serve the liturgy of the presentified gifts on Wednesday. The first book will be very busy next week, so we don't have catechism nor the Bible studies, but the following week we'll continue with the catechism classes in person in the church hall. Who wants to come is welcome. In the meantime, God willing, uh, we will have in the church services every day from 9 a.m. We'll have uh, the first week every 6.30, every uh, Wednesday we'll have the canon of St. Anthony the Creed and so forth. I'll, I usually update the schedule of services in our, um, um, in our website. Anyway, let's say the prayer. Thank you for attention, for your attention, and uh, uh, God willing, see you soon.
In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, both now and ever, into the ages of ages. Amen. Glory to thee, our God. Glory to thee. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The kingdom come, that will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the 